All right, thank you very much for the kind invitation to attend NATO's Youth Summit. It feels a bit special for me because I was actually part of in funding Swedish Atlantic Council Youth Wing. And that was about 28 years ago, I have to confess, unfortunately. I was obviously a young boy then, as you understand. But uh, it, I very much appreciate the interaction uh, between different generations on talking about NATO and NATO's future. I will try to keep my opening remarks brief within less than 10 minutes. Uh, and then I know Johan Bergen is going to provide more uh, insights also into work that Sweden is doing on civil defense and resilience. And I hope we also have time for discussions and questions as well. But let me uh, start with the Swedish Defense Commission, which is the parliamentary body that makes uh, threat assessments, among other things. And they have stated that we that uh, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine poses the greatest threat to European and Swedish security since the end of, uh, of the Second World War. It's a challenge, of course, for Sweden, for Europe, but it also, of course, has global ramification. This, of course, means within the alliance uh, increased focus of Article 5 and collective defense. And that journey started already with the first invasion in 2014. Uh, you might know the Wales summit where NATO had them. They started with the battle groups in each of, of the uh, Baltic states and also in Poland. And now we're going up to brigade sites as well. So, and the continuing, uh, continuing evolve, involvement of the alliance since 2014. But uh, of course, the full scale invasion is a turning point also for, for NATO and for Sweden. I say that the Swedish NATO membership is a direct result of Russia's full scale invasion. I always point out that if, we, if Russia had one objective with Sweden and Finland, it was to keep us outside of the alliance. And of course, as a, as a, as a direct result of Russia's full-scale invasion, Sweden and Finland have joined the alliance. It contributes to a safer Sweden and a stronger NATO as well. Now. Uh, what can Sweden bring to the alliance? Uh, there's, of course, many aspects that we, we would like to think as ourselves as a security provider into the alliance. I think one of the obvious things is, of course, uh, geopolitical location being at the heart of the Nordic Baltic area, which means that we can provide the alliance with increased strategic depth, uh, enhancing NATO's ability to deter and defend for uh, the Baltic states and Finland. Sweden will become an important staging and basing area for the whole alliance. So our geopolitical location is, of course, important for, for NATO and it will consolidate the whole northern flank. In addition, we, uh, is, we are a country that scores well on uh, innovation. You might know that, that we have a quite vibrant tech sector, which is a, which is a great asset for us in an era where defense innovation actually is all about spinning in civil technology into the military uh, field and uh, putting in new technologies in the hands of the warfighter. And, uh, uh, and we have a strong defense industrial base in Sweden, which is quite unique. There's no other country of 10 million who has the ability to design and produce submarines, fighter aircraft, advanced artillery systems, uh, surf uh, surface combatants, and also IFVs as well. So a strong defense industrial base, and we think we can contribute to NATO's uh, ability to, uh, to maintain the technological edge into the future. And therefore, we have also joined NATO's Defense Innovation Initiative, Diana and NATO's Innovation Fund. Thirdly, we also bring in regional expertise into the alliance. Uh, both we have an intelligence community which has a lot of Russia hands. Uh, and we also, when it comes to the geographic emphasis, especially on the Baltic Sea region, where we have been operating for many decades, of course, with submarines, with surface combatants, and in the air. So the Baltic Sea is a special area of expertise where we think we can strengthen the alliance. In addition, also, we're going to put an increased effort also in coordination uh, also in the North Kalot, in the coordination between Sweden, Finland and also Norway, uh, also on our ground forces. Uh, we have uh, what we call subarctic capabilities. I always say this one thing to survive in that cold environment, another uh, to be able to fight, and we, we know both. And I think it's an asset also for, for NATO as an alliance <coughs> and something we can contribute to NATO. 
Now, some of our priorities also for the future and, and for NATO's uh, summit in Washington, uh, we pointed out at least three. You could, uh, of course, provide even more, but I think one of the things that we want to make sure is to keep the strong unity within the alliance. This is a great strength. I want to emphasize that the EU and NATO has never cooperated as closely together as they have up in the run-up and during the war in Ukraine. So maintaining unity and cohesion of the alliance is absolutely credible, especially in an era where we focus so much on having a credible deterrence as well. Unity within the alliance, the other one, of course, we're going to be focusing is, uh, is the continued support of uh, NATO for Ukraine as well. You might know there's something called NUC, the NATO-Ukraine Council, and we also have CAP, where we have supported Ukraine with non-lethal weapons. I expect that to evolve even further. Right? There is a non-paper being drafted now by the Secretary General as well, which uh, talking about uh, also NATO's mission to Ukraine. And uh, the uh, conclusions from the Vilnius summit is crystal clear. Ukraine is going to be part of, of NATO. I appreciate the comments by the Secretary General when he was in Kiev and saying this is an irreversible process as well. So focusing, of course, on supporting Ukraine, I also expect uh, NATO to have a, have a role also beyond that in, in also complementing some of the work that's being done into the, into the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. And thirdly, of course, is of course strengthening NATO's uh, deterrence and defense agenda as well, and making sure that those new regional plans that are being adopted by uh, by uh, all the uh, allies, but being drafted by by Sakur, making sure that those are executable. This is critical in the era also for having a credible and, and defense uh, deterrence agenda. Uh, just some final remarks also were on Sweden, uh, also where we stand. And, uh, this is, of course, about adjusting our defense planning, but also our, our uh, armed forces and our fo defense postures to uh, the, our NATO membership. Therefore, we intend to present a bill to the Swedish parliament already in December, where we're going to having a review of our, of our defense posture in order to strengthen it and live up to the requirements also that's coming with the new regional plans as well, the NATO's new force model. Uh, the basis, of course, for, for this is both Article 5, but I also want to emphasize Article 5 or Article 3, which is a national requirement as well, that you have a strong national capability and that you adjust your defense postures to the needs of of the alliance and that you make sure also that uh, you have a, a credible national defense plan. I think that's extremely important. Uh, we are stepping up uh, our defense investments after decades of underinvestment. I want to emphasize we have doubled our defense investment between 2020 and, and 2024 from 6 billion to 12 billion, which means that we this year is at 2.2% of GDP in defense investment and we're going to have a trajectory up to 26 by 2028. And that's absolutely crucial also because, of course, we've been donating a lot of defense equipment to Ukraine and the security environment has, has uh, drastically deteriorated as well. Uh, some of the things that we are quite well prepared to handle, I must say, in, a, in an international comparison is actually um, personnel. We have a conscript system in Sweden which serves us well, uh, which means that we have about uh, next year about 8,000 conscripts. And um, since we have a lot of conscripts, then many of those conscripts, uh, at least a third of those, stay in the armed forces after they're done with their conscription, working as a soldier, as a non-commissioned officer, or as an officer as well. So personnel is one of the things that we've been uh, been drawing a lot of attention also internationally. I had a lot of of, uh, of colleagues uh, from all over Europe coming to Sweden to, to discuss these matters as well. So a conscript system at the same time as we have standing forces as well, uh, which provide higher availability and readiness are crucial. We also stand ready also by next year, starting from January 2025, we will make our first contribution to NATO's uh, FLF or Forward Land Forces, uh, and that will be uh, reduced army battalion to Latvia, which we are going to be coordinating together with Denmark under the framework leadership of, uh, of uh, Canada, who is in charge of, of the battle group in, um, in Latvia. So that's where we stand right now, and I'm glad to give the floor to Johan Bergen.
thank you so much for having me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I, too, like the minister, uh, want to underscore, I think, the importance of, of having these kinds of dialogues with young people. You are the future. You need to be part of this dialogue about the future. Uh, I, too, am very proud and happy that we are now NATO members in my youth about 20 years ago, getting old. I uh, uh, Actually, when I was a student in Uppsala, I wrote an article about uh, arguing that Sweden should join NATO. Back then, everybody laughed at me. Now I think we're the ones doing the laughing, at least everyone in this room who's, who believe in this. Uh, no, but seriously, um, this is very important. And I wanted to say a few words about um, total defense or civil defense, uh, which is something we've been working a lot on in Sweden during the Cold War. But now, as we look at the new threat uh, landscape, we are rebuilding our total defense capabilities. And we hope to really uh, contribute in this domain uh, to NATO. And I think there are four, four steps of building resilience that we would like to, I'd like to emphasize here to do. Number one is about insight, understanding the challenge. Number two, understanding that everyone in our society has a role to play. Uh, number three, actually strengthening our capabilities. How do we build civil and total defense? And finally, the importance of working together. And on the first point, uh, building insight or understanding the situation. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, Rob Bauer touched on this earlier, but obviously the understanding of, of, of the seriousness of the situation varies across Europe, across the world. And in Sweden, uh, even though we have a history and a geographical proximity, um, when my boss and the minister in, in, at CEL and at the, at the security conference in January made statements that there could be war in Sweden, uh, this led to a lot of uh, excitement and discussion. And I think well, obviously one needs to understand that many of us spend a lot of time working on these issues and, and we focus on Ukraine and we feel very acutely uh, the threats. But if you live an ordinary life and work on other things, then it's something that sort of happens in the background. And to some extent, there has been a little bit of a return to business as usual since uh, February 2024, 2022. So it's very important to, for all of us to understand the real uh, dangers we face. I think you all do so, but I think when we have the conversation about total defense, we need to remember that, that not everyone is in the same place. Number two, uh, what, is, what is the total defense concept? I think many of you probably know about it, but just to sort of underline the basics. Uh, so total defense is the sum total of the military and civil defense uh, in, a, in a society. And I think you all know what the military defense is. The military is part of all our Western societies. Civil defense is, is basically all the other parts of society. So it's the other 97.5%. It's, uh, it's the agencies, it's the private sector, it's the municipalities and regions, academia, civil society. So it's the, the combined total uh, of, our, of our society outside the military. And that gives its immense strength and ability, but it also has its challenges because it's a very complex uh, system uh, to manage and run. And that's why we need to spend so much time in planning and, and developing that. Um, in terms of what we're actually doing, in terms of building resilience, because when we talk about civil defense in Sweden, the term that NATO tends to use is resilience and building resilience. Well, there are many, many things uh, that can be done, and there are many things that we're working on. So one thing, for example, is that uh, about a year and a half ago in uh, November or in October 2022, right before this government uh, ceded to power, uh, we created a new structure in Sweden for civil defense and crisis preparedness. So we created 10 uh, civil preparedness sectors, things like transport and, and healthcare and, and civil protection as a way to organize our, our building of capacity. We, um, we're working with the private sector to, um, uh, to build uh, uh, capacity in, in, for example, security of supply. We all know that if we face a much more challenging situation, we're going to have to rely on ourselves a bit more, even though today being part of NATO, we hope and believe that the supply lines uh, to the West will be better than during the Cold War when we were alone. That's another uh, advantage of being a part of NATO. And so, but we need to plan for a situation where, a scares, where certain resources will become much, much more scarce. And how do we do that? Well, it really in involves um, using the private sector because they uh, are mainly the, the, the actors that produce uh, goods and services in our society. So there are different ways we can do that. We can build, uh, we can build stockpiles in warehouses. Uh, we can look at supply, supply chains, and we can look at how companies could, for, for example, redirect their production uh, in a context of, of, of heightened alert or war. Um, we're also looking at civil protection. How do we actually protect our uh, civilians? And here, in this respect, Sweden is uh, in, in a fairly fortunate situation because we have about 65,000 bomb shelters, which will protect about 70% of the population. Uh, many countries in Europe don't have that kind of situation. They um, have far, far fewer bomb shelters, and that means uh, that they have a more challenging situation. But in Sweden, many of these bomb shelters were built during the Cold War. 
And as a result, uh, they need to be modernized. They need to be improved. They need to have new uh, filters to deal with chemical or uh, biological or radiological or nuclear attacks. And that's one thing uh, we're investing in now, upgrading uh, our bomb shelters. Uh, a final area that I would like to touch, to touch on in resilience is the whole aspect of uh, disinformation or psychological warfare. I think this is perhaps something you've talked about today. And I think as the, the young generation, I think this is uh, something I, I especially want to underline because we see obviously in this new uh, landscape with, with artificial intelligence, with cyber, that there's much, much more room for disinformation and fake news. And we all have a responsibility to be alert, to be vigilant, and most of all, to have media literacy, right? To think about what is it we're reading? Is this a credible source? Is this a source we want to pass on to other people? So when we share things on social media, we all need to be very, very careful. And by the way, this is not just a challenge for young people. I see many older people passing on things online that they perhaps shouldn't. But the point is, we should really think about how we act in social media and what information we're sharing and have a critical, um, a critical attitude to the information that we're, that we're partaking in. And finally then, um, it's important to understand that this is not something Sweden or any member state uh, does alone. This is something we do together. And again, that's one of the fundamental strengths of the NATO alliance, that we are so many together who can work together to achieve our goals on civil defense, on military defense, and on total defense. And this, this we need to remember. So those are a few um, areas of civil defense that I want to touch on, but both uh, the minister and I are very keen to have some space for questions because we know you're an inquisitive crowd. Uh, so I think I'll... I'll conclude there and look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, State uh, Secretary Berger and uh, Minister Johnson. Thank you as well, and welcome to the stage. We will now have a Q&A that's going to be facilitated by my colleague, Sara Francien. I want to start off by thanking the Minister of Defense, Paul Jonsson, and the State Secretary, Secretary to the Minister of Civil Defense, Johan Bergen, uh, for taking this time engaging in youth and, uh, of course, engaging here today in the NATO Youth Summit, sharing your thoughts and expertise. Um, it's really great to have you here today. Um, I was going to start off by asking some questions. Uh, but I think that I've seen today that all of you are very keen on asking questions, which I think is great. So we will actually start by taking questions uh, straight away from the audience. Uh, and I see a hand over here. So in the back. No. Yeah, exactly. So if you could please stand up and uh, introduce yourself and where you're from. So my name is Nick Pavlenko. I'm representing the Egoloni University, but originally I am from the Republic of Moldova. And I want actually to, str uh, to stress the topic of the NATO partnership and especially the military partnership between Sweden and the Republic of Moldova. What, what would be the core principles? Uh, this is the straight question to the Minister mm -hmm. of Defense on that. What would be the core principles of the potential military partnership and, of course, uh, in, in the situation of a potential threat which is coming from Russia and of, uh, of, of some, some, some sort of defense and uh, civil defense as well. Uh, what will be the principles and what will be highlighted as well and the other issues? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the question. Actually, both me and the Minister for Civil Defense are going to uh, Moldova together. I think it's on the 18th and 19th of August. I have, of course, met my colleagues several times. So we're discussing a lot of areas where we could cooperate in, in the area of air defense possibly. I know that you have requirements. I know, of course, that the EU is doing an important job there with their, their mission as well in order to countering hybrid threats and so forth. And uh, I'm just excited to go there. And uh, it's, of course, important to also to strengthen Moldova's security given uh, the exposure that uh, that you feel with the, the missiles going over your territory and the geopolitical location as well. So I, I probably have a more clear-cut answer after I've been there, but uh, both me and Kaloska are going there in mid-August as well. Thank you for that question. Uh, the next question, uh, who wants to ask the next question? Maybe for uh, uh, the State Secretary. We can take the lady in the back there. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. My name is Antonia and I come from Romania, so very close to Moldova. But I was wondering in terms of this uh, concept that you described on to total defense, 
how do you approach critical infrastructure protection? We know that Sweden was a, or one of the countries that first had a very consistent 5G legislation, uh, especially to bolster this concept of tackling unwanted interdependencies by states that might have an agenda that is totally different from ours. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. And the, the, the whole area of protection of critical infrastructure, whether it be on land or undersea, is something that I think is uh, taking up a lot of attention of policymakers and people around, around Europe and, and, and North America. And I think uh, uh, the, the challenge here, of course, is that there are so many uh, elements of infrastructure and, and civil and military infrastructure that are, that are necessary to protect, so that we need to think very carefully about how uh, how we are protecting it. And I can tell you that both at the national level here in Sweden, we're working extensively on this, but also in the context of NATO and in the context of the EU, uh, there's a lot of work on, on, on how to look at this and different working groups and, and different ideas. So uh, it's an area that, we, uh, that we're taking very seriously. And it involves, for example, working much, much more closely with the private sector that I mentioned before, because most of the critical infrastructure is usually operated, uh, owned and run. Uh, by the private sector, so we have to have appropriate mechanisms for coordinating with them, for sharing information. Uh, one challenge sometimes is, you know, there might be a, a challenge or a, an incident in one piece of critical infrastructure, but for that uh, particular actor, uh, that's something perhaps not completely out of the ordinary. But if you look in the broader context, it could be part of something bigger, something hybrid perhaps. So sharing information, um, understanding, again, the challenges and, and, and getting out the message to all uh, owners and, and uh, producers of critical infrastructure across Sweden, across the EU, across North America, that uh, to be vigilant, to understand what kind of um, steps you need to take to protect your infrastructure is, is a key part. But this is a very much an ongoing, an ongoing work and something we're very much seized of. Thank you. Great. We have someone in the back, all the way over, in the back over there. And uh, let's ask a question to the uh, Swedish Minister of Defence. Is it working? Yes. Uh, that will change um, uh, the perspective of my question. Um, okay. uh, my name is Rusudan from Swedish Defense University, originally from Georgia, and I'm researching civil defense uh, in Georgian context. Mm. And I find this Swedish approach to civil defense to be extremely interesting, especially given the years of peace in the country. And this concept sometimes seems to so hard uh, to sell in other countries. And given Swedish experience, I'm more interested in societal reaction uh, to this policy and um, them accepting the responsibility towards the national defense. And how do you see exporting this knowledge to other NATO countries and other allies outside of the alliance in terms of society accepting its role within the overall defense um, preparedness. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to give this uh, okay. question to the <laughs> sure. expert on the panel here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is our number one export product right now, right? Getting this out. No, I mean, great question. And it's something I think um, we uh, approach with humility uh, because we are aware that we had a pretty extensive system during the Cold War. We now have a long journey uh, domestically. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot of work to do. So we want to be uh, humble in, in how we address this internationally and don't want to walk around. You know, there used to be a joke that when Swedes uh, went around, traveled around the world, we would always say we have this great domestic system for welfare that we would tell everybody about. So we want to be a little, and by the way, that was from the, the other party that we don't represent, although we're very, very strong on welfare too. But, um, <laughs> uh, but my, 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 uh, look, uh, the polls show that 80 to 90 percent of Swedes uh, believe in this willingness to defend the country and want to contribute. About half of them with weapons and the other half in a civil defense capacity. That's a pretty high number. In Finland, it's even higher. But in many other countries, when you poll, it's a bit lower. So there's definitely something there on paper. And I think it's more than just on paper. Now, I think we need to be acutely aware that the context in different countries is very different. I was just in the United States last week and we had a NATO meeting. And when you talk to uh, our allies, our friends, uh, you know, ge geography is a factor and a, and a fact. The further you, where you are from Ukraine, the less immediate the threat feels. That's just, that's just a fact. So we need to be, you know, what might work in Sweden or Finland in, times of, uh, in terms of an information approach, in terms of marketing, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, information is not necessarily going to work uh, in another country. So we, be, we need to be very respectful that each country will have its own dialogue, its own context, its own history. You know, we also have our histories with, with some of our antagonists whereas other countries might not. So I think you need to be very uh, honest and respectful of the different contexts. And we're more than happy, and we are 
uh, having those discussions with our other countries about the t kinds of information approaches you can have. Uh, but there's definitely a, a big appetite from other uh, NATO member states for the, either the Swedish or the Finnish, the, the Finnish called comprehensive defense, we call it total defense, there's some similarities, a few differences, but there's a lot of interest and we're very happy to share our information, but without trying to sort of uh, oversell it or pretend that it's the only way to do things, right? But very happy to share our, our lessons and our emerging, uh, our emerging uh, approaches. We have time for one last question and we'll have the gentleman in the front here. Uh, no. Me. <laughs> uh, hello, ministers. Uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Francesco, and I'm a postdoc at Harvard. My question my question actually was a bit more technical. So when you look at the defense budget, which is a very critical topic among NATO members, uh, Sweden had the budget around one percent for defense from 2011 to 2019, <clears throat> and only increased to around 1.5 percent in 2023. So how, I mean, do you plan to abide to the minimum 2% that NATO has? And with the increasing chance of Trump coming back, uh, coming back to the Oval Office and the, uh, let's say, delicateness that he has about the topic, what do you think? Uh, let me, is it applicable for Sweden in the short notice? Or, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on this topic? Thank you. We get it, we're joining an alliance where defense investment is, of course, about burden sharing, but it's about also cohesion within the alliance. And as I said in my introductory remarks, Sweden has doubled its defensive investment from 2020 to 2024, from 6 billion to 12 billion, which means that we registered this year to NATO, we would add the 2.2% of GDP this year. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, that's, of course, a mechanism that uh, that's as it's the same for everybody within the alliance, so the, the, you can't cheat on that. And we have a trajectory up to 2.6 by 2028. So I think, I think between, uh, I think uh, together with Finland, we increased the defense investment the most in Europe uh, uh, during this last. Uh, we're number three in Europe when it came to our defense investment, catching up after decades of underinvestment, as I said. Now, disregarding who wins the elections in November, I think that the uh, Europeans has to be uh, prepared to do more when it comes to both uh, uh, divested, uh, investing in their own uh, collective defense capabilities and supporting Ukraine. We get that in the long run. Uh, it's not sustainable that one ally can provide uh, about uh, almost 70% of, of, of the defense expenditures and the other 31 stands for 30%. So I think that uh, pressure will mount on us for good reasons as well. As of now, I think for in the run up to the Washington summit, I think it's about 20 allies, so we reached 2%. Uh, we were talking about the Wales summit, and then I think it was six allies. So things are moving in the right uh, trajectory, but we have challenges. One is many Europeans are now have the same problems, handling decades of underinvestments, the uh, doing thing, uh, also investing into the new and emerging technologies, leaving up to the new regional plans and the capability requirements there, and also replenishing our stocks. Uh, Sweden sent defense equipment for to Ukraine for about uh, 3 billion euros uh, or about a half a brigade and of course we have to replenish and reinvest that so so I, if you ask me is 2% enough no 2% is, is a floor but it's not the ceiling and we see some allies now being up on 2.5 or 3% or Poland being the shining city on top of the hill with 4% so so yeah defense investments of course going to be a huge thing at the, at the Washington summit as well we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you in the audience that asked questions. And thank you so much for your time, the Minister of Defense and the State Secretary, Secretary to the Minister of Civil Defense. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you.